This is Duke University. The topic is freedom of speech uh, in Islam, but even getting into that, I want to say a few things about this big issue of Islam in the West. And uh, sometimes stories highlight things more than, you know, a lot of scholarly blah, blah, and, well, with respect to the scholars, of course. Uh, but, so let me share you a story, a personal story, which gave me some insight years later, but it's also a fun story. That's a story from my very first trip to the United States, which took place like almost two decades ago. You're welcome. Good evening. Uh, well, two decades ago, I was a younger man, and I was excited to see America, the land of uh, Rocky Balboa, you know, from my perspective at the time. And I came here like uh, for a conference, then I visited a friend of mine who used to live here, and he took me from place to place, from New York to California, and showed me a lot of places, and I was excited, and I was happy, and everything. Uh, one morning, we were really hungry, and he said, Let's have breakfast. I said, sure. He said, let's eat at the McDonald's. I said, like, will we eat burgers for breakfast? He said, no, no. McDonald's has a breakfast menu. I said, OK, let me see what that is. I walked in, and he bought me a breakfast menu, uh, a full one. And that was the first time in my life that I saw and tasted pancakes. We didn't have pancakes in Turkey in the mid-90s. Uh, at least I didn't see it. And he showed how to put the syrup and the butter, and it sucked all of it. And, and I tasted it, and I said, man, this is the most delicious thing I've ever had in my life. I instantly fell in love with pancakes. So next year, I came to the US again for summer vacation. And I was eager to eat pancakes, right? But I had a little misunderstanding. I was thinking that pancakes are an exclusive McDonald's product. <laughs> That's why I was like desperately looking for a McDonald's restaurant before 10.30 a.m. because I had figured out that they change into lunch menu at 10.30 to get the pancakes. And it went on for a few days, and I think it was the third day, like I was in Manhattan walking, and I saw a restaurant, a non-McDonald's restaurant, which said, we serve pancakes. I said, ah, they stole it from McDonald's. It took a while to realize that pancakes are actually a larger phenomenon than McDonald's itself, and I had a lot of pancakes since then. But also, I took a lesson from that story years later, and that was that foreign cultures might be a little misleading, a little confusing when you meet them for the first time. Uh, you might misunderstand from the first appearances. And well, if you misunderstand the cuisine of a different culture, it's not a big problem. You'll figure out as I did with the pancakes in a few days. But if you misunderstand the history, the value, the religion of a different culture, let alone a different civilization, that might be a harder problem to deal with. Uh, and uh, besides that, as someone in the media, in this business called media, uh, I also think that we are actually very prone to misunderstand different societies today, this day and age, precisely because of this thing called media, which brings us a lot of information, actually, about those societies. They do, right? You open news and you hear a lot of breaking news from all parts of the world, places that you've never seen. Different stuns and you know, bombs and killings and wars and so on and so forth. Uh, and well, if you're watching very objective and non-biased and very, very like uh, accurate news sources like Fox News, as I understand this here, you, you can still get maybe a very good point of view, but they might still mislead you because the media has a certain dynamic. It shows us nasty stuff that is out there. In other words, you hear all the shocking news that is coming from a different civilization. You hear all the bombings and killings there and all the nasty narrative there. And that shapes your image of the other. 
Uh, that is really what's happening since 9-11 in the US and in Europe as well. Uh, the radical, violent groups, fanatic groups, hateful groups or individuals that act in the name of Islam uh, that are a part of the big reality of Muslims, but only an extreme version of that, shape the image of Islam in the West, and they, they create this image. But let me tell you, the same dynamic is working on our side as well. In other words, the stuff we hear from the West, where I live, in Istanbul and even beyond, if you go to the Middle East, is not the nicest narratives coming from the West. Uh, let me give you an example to highlight this problem and make some, you know, have some facts. I made a research in 2012 uh, to figure out which Christian opinion leader appeared most frequently in the Turkish media. The research was simple. It was a Google search. It took seven seconds and, because I searched the word pastor, you know, the <laughs> Turkish version of that. It showed me that the most frequently quoted opinion leader in the West, Christian, in terms of Christianity, which appeared most frequently in the Turkish media, was this gentleman in Florida who wanted to burn a, burn a copy of the Quran. Well, I know he's very marginal here in the US, and a lot of mainstream people thought he's doing something very wrong, very disrespectful, but he made the news. I remember reading a headline one morning saying, now they are burning our Quran. Well, it was not they, it was just a small denomination in Florida, and nobody knew, so he made an impression. So that, but however, that made the impression. So we are in this vicious dynamic of reading the other civilization, if we are civilizations, by the way, that's the thing, but let's buy that rhetoric for now from Huntington, let's say, uh, through looking at the disturbing elements because they, they attract our attention. And that's why it is really, really important to try to reach out, try to get a sense, try to see the diversity which is out there, which is not that easy always, but we should try. So that's a general uh, statement I would have on Islam and the West, and, uh, which is, I think, very important to remember. Now let's come to this more specific issue of freedom of speech. Uh, we do have problems with freedom of speech in the broader Muslim world. And these problems are not always related to religion. Some of our political leaders don't like to be criticized, and that is not related to religion. They just don't like to be criticized. And when they uh, see a strong critic, they think, oh, he's a terrorist, he's a spy, he's a foreign something saboteur, and you, know, you can get in trouble with, with that. The same thing happens in Russia as well. It happens certainly in Russia, China, let alone North Korea. So that's a universal problem with lack of tolerance to criticism and dissent. Uh, so it's not a specifically Islamic issue. But you see that trend in, in, some, uh, in many Muslim-majority uh, societies as well. Uh, but there are also problems coming directly from the interpretations of religion that limit freedom of speech. Uh, and that issue is one of the things I tackle in my book and in my articles. I'm saying, well, let's reinterpret those you know, problems regarding of, uh, freedom of speech, and let's have an understanding of Islam which will actually appreciate freedom of speech. Not maybe hate speech in a violent way, but still, let's appreciate critical speech. But when I make this argument, people sometimes ask, well, why do we need this freedom of speech thing? Like, why is this necessary? Maybe you should begin from that. Really, why do we need freedom of speech? Well, in my view, I think we need freedom of speech in every issue to be able to find the truth on that issue. At least get closer to truth. Because none of us have full access to the truth, whatever that is. We can get glimpses of it. So I have this perspective, you have that perspective we share, we have a debate, we have a discussion, we maybe even yell at each other, but maybe we come to an agreement, maybe someone else can get a perspective from those. Because between all these discussions, we can get somewhat closer to the truth. It was Ottoman liberal intellectual Nam Kemal, whose ideas have actually been an inspiration for me for decades, he has a great phrase. He said, from the clash of ideas comes the glimpse of truth. Turks would, I'm sure, know that quote. Uh, 
Varia e haikikat doar. Varia e haikikat doar. So, but to accept it, accept this point of view, you should begin by saying that there is no authority which will give us truth in the first place. If someone knows the truth for all of us, then we don't need freedom of speech. Because freedom of speech will only confuse our minds. So if some big guy, some big leader, some big cleric, some big person already knows it and he establishes it, then we don't need freedom of speech. Freedom of speech is a loss of time, maybe confusing minds, and so on and so forth. So there is a tension between freedom of speech the idea that supports freedom of speech and authoritarianism, the idea that authority comes down and we should all be subservient to it. Now, when I say that, I sometimes see people saying, okay, so you mean that religions are incompatible with freedom of speech because religions claim truth, right? That's, that's correct. Religions, Islam and Christianity, especially universalistic religions, they do claim truth. However, two points are important here. There is a big difference between claiming the truth and imposing it. Because you can say, this is my truth, I'm saying it, and if you like it, accept it. Or, you, and you can say there's no compulsion in religion, as a verse in the Quran actually declares. You can say, well, this is my truth, I'm just proclaiming it. I want the freedom of speech to be able to proclaim it, but I'm not imposing it. So having a truth and imposing are two different things. Moreover, even if there is a truth within the religious community, who interprets that truth is a key question. Well, if you're Catholic, maybe you'll say the Pope interprets it, but even the Catholics sometimes have disagreements with the Pope. You know, these days, maybe some conservative American Catholics don't fully agree with everything the Pope says. Uh, and in Islam, like if we say, okay, Islam is the truth, what, which Islam? Whose interpretation? The Shia or Sunni? Which part of Sunni? Among the Shia, there are different approaches. In the Sunni world, there are so many sects and approaches. They're modernists, they're revisionists, they're this and that. And there are freelance Muslims like myself who say, well, I just understand as I can. There is no authority to say this is the truth for all of us. We have, the, we have to struggle to understand. Now, of course, religions can understand all this diversity and this pluralism and work and speak within that pluralism, then they would be fundamental liberal in the sense that they accept liberty of other peoples to have different ideas and have uh, different uh, points of view. But religions can be authoritarian. And this is a problem for all religions. Uh, let's not forget that Christianity was not a very liberal religion for a very long time. Uh, if you go to Italy, you sometimes in cities, you see uh, torture museums. You see the devices the Inquisition used to question the heretics for their own good, to make them you know, confess their sins and, or their, their worshiping or something. It took a while for Christians to you know, struggle with that and, and come to a more maybe liberal consensus. Even still, some maybe Christians are not fully happy with the liberal consensus. And in the Islamic world today, there are groups that are a bit like the Inquisition, who are willing to impose their understanding of religion. ISIS is the great example of that, a scary example for all of us, for you and for many people in that part of the world. So we have some inquisitors alive today in the Muslim world, but they are not the only thing about our faith. But how will we move forward? How will we deal with these things? And of course, ISIS is very extreme. Uh, Al-Qaeda is very extreme. These are very small pockets of zealots uh, in the Muslim world. But even in the bigger Muslim uh, world, when you go to countries like Iran, Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Yemen, you will come to apostasy laws, blasphemy laws. And sometimes you read and say, oh, if a, a blogger has been flogged in Saudi Arabia, uh, somebody got you know, imprisoned for converting into Christianity and so on and so forth. Because in the Muslim tradition, in the legal aspect of Islam, in fiqh, or sharia, however you call it. Sharia is the ideal, but fiqh is the application of that in, in actual jurisprudence. Let's say sharia for simple uh, terms. There are aspects that limit freedom of speech and bring some harsh uh, punishments, especially two concepts are here important, blasphemy and apostasy. Blasphemy, kufr, apostasy, ridda in Arabic terms. Uh, these are like 
offenses according to the Sharia, and they can give you a real hard time. Uh, in four Sunni schools of thought, and in the Shia, Jafari school of thought, in the mainstream legal tradition, blasphemy, sorry, I'll come to it, apostasy, which is to declare that you're not a Muslim anymore, is considered as a capital crime, which means that you are executed for that. And this took place in certain countries over the past couple of decades. Uh, a, a few Christian converts were given death penalty in Afghanistan, uh, in, in, in Sudan, in Iran as well. Uh, of course, other scholars challenge this, but there is this issue of blasphemy. And even uh, this idea that you should uh, punish apostasy with uh, violence uh, can lead to terrorist acts. And we see that in the issue of blasphemy, which is a related concept in Islam. But blasphemy is when even when you're not Muslim, if you insult the sacred, insult God or the prophet, uh, that is also considered a big offense, sometimes a capital offense, the, uh, the punishment of kufr. And the people who attacked Charlie Hebdo had that in mind. They thought that it is a crime to attack the prophet, and you insulted the prophet, and we will give you a, a lesson, which is capital punishment. And if the government does it, we'll do it by our guns. So they had that very uh, disturbing uh, terrorist attack on the French magazine Charlie Hebdo, whose cartoons I didn't enjoy either, but I didn't think that that was a, a response that they should have, uh, they should have got. So these two issues are important, and if we're going to ever speak about Islam and freedom of speech, we have to deal with these. And that is why I have a chapter about them in my book, uh, Islam Without Extremes, A Muslim Case for Liberty, the chapter titled Freedom from Islam, which is a good read, by the way, if you're interested in books. You know. uh, there I get into these issues, and I s underline a few things. First of all, there's something curious. Uh, for all Muslims, the only undisputed source of Islam and Islamic law is the Quran. But in the Quran, there is no concept of either blasphemy nor apostasy. They don't exist. There's no punishment in the Quran for these crimes from the Sharia perspective. Actually, when you just read the Quran, there are verses that seem to offer a totally nonviolent response. Regarding blasphemy, for example, uh, especially about ridiculing of Islam, which is a major issue. Remember Charlie Hebdo, the Danish cartoons and all of that. There is only one verse in the Quran which directly addresses this issue. It's in Surah 4, Nisa. I can't remember the verse, uh, verse number, but I've written about it. I can find it later for you. Uh, it says, if you hear God's verses being mocked by a group of people, then do not sit with them unless they engage in a different discourse. It doesn't say go and kill them. It doesn't even say go and silence them. It says go, do not sit with them. Because at the time of Prophet Muhammad, there were pagans who were making fun of Islam and Quran and so on and so forth. The word says don't be with those people because they're insulting your faith and that's really disrespectful and you move away from those people. So you boycott those people. But there is nothing in the Quran which uh, suggests a wild response. The punishments for blasphemy came later when Islamic scholars were developing the law in the, after Prophet Muhammad in the first century of Islam. And interestingly, under the Umayyad dynasty. The Umayyad dynasty is not generally very popular in the Muslim world for good reasons, because with the exception of two Umayyad sultans, they were generally corrupt despots. One of them, Yazid, uh, in the horrific incident of Karbala, even martyred the grandson of, uh, of the prophet. Uh, so these were like, I don't know, Saddam Hussein's or Bashar Assad's of, uh, of the seventh century. And uh, the Umayyads had a problem because since they were corrupt despots, they uh, were criticized by a lot of Muslims and they didn't like that criticism. And they uh, used the notion of blasphemy to punish their critics and even execute them. One of their prominent critics, Kailan al dimakshi a prominent scholar who defended the idea of free will, and from the idea of free will, which, who also defended that sultans don't get their power as a gift of God, they get, they sh they're responsible to the people. Uh, it was an important debate in early Islam. He was executed. He was the first person to be executed in the Muslim world for blasphemy. 
And wow, he was not a disrespectful Muslim to God. He was only disrespectful to the corrupt caliph, the tyrant. So in that case, during that, that's one example showing us that during the evolution of Islamic law, a lot of steps were taken sometimes for the interests of the political community. And today, it's a good reason to go and question these uh, approaches and maybe have the understanding of blasphemy, which is totally Quranic based, which says nothing violent uh, about responses to blasphemy. Issue of apostasy, which is even more interesting. Apostasy, which is to say, I'm not a Muslim anymore, and you know, I become a Christian, a Jew, a Buddhist, an infidel, agnostic, whatever you want. So to abandon Islam as a religion. That is, as I said, considered as a capital offense and punished, not in Turkey, not in countries where you don't have uh, Islamic law, but in some countries that you have Islamic law, that's the case with apostasy. And again, there is nothing in the Quran which suggests that apostates should be punished. There is simply no worse for any earthly punishment. The Quran says, you know, unbelievers will go to hell, but that is afterlife, and if you're not believing in Islam, you don't have to believe in afterlife in a way. For the time being, it will be okay. I don't know what's going to happen in afterlife. Well, I have a perception on that, but you know, that's a different thing. And even there, what happens to unbelievers is, is a, I'm, not, I'm not getting into that right now. Uh, where did the banner on apostasy come from? Well, it comes from the writing of medieval Islamic scholars, again, from the Sunni jurisprudence, and even in the Shia jurisprudence as well, from the first, let's say, five big schools of jurisprudence. And it comes from certain hadiths, sayings attributed to Prophet Muhammad, which are disputed. But when you look at the writings of the scholars that said apostasy is a crime punishable by death, you actually see something interesting. For in that time, when the Sharia was taking its form and the early schools were developing, the Islamic community was constantly at war with the Byzantine Empire or the Sassanid Empire. So they, had, they were in a constant war situation. And in that context, an apostate meant somebody who deserted the Muslim army and who joined the enemy. It was, in that context, what we would call high treason today, which is something that still governments do not tolerate, most of them, in our part of the world. That is why, for example, the Hanafi school of jurisprudence, the more flexible among the four Sunni schools, to which generally Turks subscribe to and Central Asians, uh, Hanafi said, Apostates should be punished if they are males. Females, they don't count. This was not misogyny. Well, there are some misogyny in some, in some traditions, but this was simple recognition that females are not soldiers. Because for them, an apostate was the potential uh, traitor who would join the enemy. Now, when you see examples like that, you say, hmm, maybe in 7th, 8th century, uh, at the time of war and context and in that, it, it could have made sense to consider apostasy as a crime, but in the modern world today, where your religious allegiance has nothing to do with your military allegiance to an army or something, your apostasy, uh, defending apostasy as uh, a capital crime, a crime of any sort, uh, has no reasonable basis. And since it's not the, in the Quran anyway, which, is, which makes it much more easy to discuss, I think Muslim scholars should move forward. And there are many Muslim scholars, like uh, Ayatollah Muntazari, who passed away in Iran several years ago, who opposed this ban on apostasy. Rashid Ganoushi in Tunisia, who has very progressive views on this. In Turkey, conservative scholars like Ibn Hayrettin Karaman, who some political views I don't fancy these days, but wrote on this issue and actually said that apostasy is not a crime, that's a misunderstanding. So there are these kind of reformist approaches, which is, I think, the way forward for the countries that, which claim to implement Islamic law. In other words, when we go back to the sources, when we look at the context of law, when we come to today and revisit it and reinterpret it, actually all these issues regarding blasphemy and apostasy and other limitations of, uh, of freedom of speech can be dealt with from within the Islamic tradition without being not abandoning Muslims, their loyalty to their texts, but reinterpreting it. And I think that's way forward. You can just have totally secular laws, which is fine, the Turkey way, let's say, but also from even within, from the, within the Islamic tradition, you can have a reinterpretation which would deal with these troubling issues. But here's one question, and I face this a lot. Why would Muslims take that step? Why would they accept a reform? 
they, we, we hate the word reform, let's say reinterpretation, a revision, a revival, a reconsideration of our tradition. Why would we do that? Uh, well, if you're looking from the West, of course you should do it. You should be in the 21st century. Why are these medieval notions and so on and so forth? But a lot of Muslims ask, why do we need this? And here's the interesting conundrum. The fact that the West is promoting this becomes sometimes precisely the reason not to go there. Why? Well, because the Muslim world in the past two centuries has a troubling situation with the West. On the one hand, the West is the source of, most of the time, liberal and democratic ideas that many Muslim intellectuals like and say, this is good. You know, it's good that you have freedom of speech. I mean, and, and also technology and also schools and institutions. West, in the past two centuries, was ahead of the Muslim world in many areas, like, let's say, worldly areas. Uh, political systems, legal, syst uh, legal traditions, universities, you know, technology, all of that. So in co and also liberal ideas come from the West. So, and it makes sense to a lot of people, but the same West is also threatening the Muslim world. It's humiliating the Muslim world. The same West is also the imperialist power that you are angry at for sometimes understandable reasons, for some legitimate reasons sometimes. So that is a big conundrum and because it is sometimes psychologically difficult to be angry at a foreign civilization that humiliates or threatens you and also get some ideas from there which will help you improve your, you know, state of being. And sometimes anger at the West easily becomes anger at these liberal democratic ideas and trash them out. So this is one problem that I routinely face when I uh, speak to fellow Muslims in, our, in my part of the world. I mean, and I say, well, I, 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 I'm speaking of liberalism, democracy, EU standards, you know, freedom of speech, blah, blah, blah. And someone will certainly say, we know who they are. They're helping Israel to bomb the Palestinians. All, all that should go. Of course, they're throwing the baby with the bathwater, I think that's the term. Okay. Uh, but it happens. So in that case, what can the West do if they want to help the situation? Because since we're in a Western situation, I mean, environment, let's say, what can the West do? Well, just lecturing Muslims and how back-minded they are and how they should change generally doesn't help and actually it's counterproductive. What will really help would be the West to be loyal to its principles and to be principled on all these issues of democracy, freedom of speech, freedom of religion and, and individual freedom and all sorts of, let's say, liberal standards. Uh, when the West engages in double standard, actually it helps the narrative on the other side that this is all a Western imperialistic design to break the bones of Muslims and corrupt their societies. Uh, or w the argument that this is all a Western conspiracy to impose the, their own values on Muslim societies. And what kind of, for example, double standards here I'm talking about? Let's take the issue of freedom of speech and let's uh, take the issue of insult of the sacred. Uh, as you probably know, since the Salman Rushdie affair and after the Danish cartoons and recently the Charlie Hebdo affair, uh, many Muslims said, well, we don't approve these violent attacks, but we also think that the sacred should not be insulted. So we want laws to protect the sacred. In return, a lot of Westerners said, we don't care what's your sacred. This is freedom of speech. We insult sacred. It's not a problem. We joke with our prophet, so you should joke with yours. Or if you don't, you should be comfortable with that. We don't care. But the same, some of the same countries which have this argument, and let's say governments or institutions or intellectuals which have this argument, would defend other limitations on freedom of speech, and one clear example is Holocaust denial. I think Holocaust denial is crazy, and it's a big disrespect to real Holocaust victims and uh, millions of Jewish people uh, who still live with, the, with that memory, but it's an opinion, a wrong, crazy opinion, but it's an opinion. Uh, so a lot of Muslims are saying, isn't there a double standard here? Why are you allowing uh, 
insult to the sacred, the prophet, God, but not anything that insults the memory of the Holocaust victims. I had this conversation with a European intellectual, and he said, they're not the same thing. One of them is a belief in a mythical deity. The other one is a fact. It's just millions of people who died in their memory. And I said, well, that is a fact and a myth based on your categorizations. For the Muslim, there is no bigger fact than God. But well, you can call it a pre-modern idea, whatever you can call it, what? But for him, that is sacred. And human life is sacred too, I agree. But belief in God and the prophet, they are sacred too. So my argument is that not we should bend these things, but at least we should have a universal standard, try to. And when we push a double standard on another society saying that this is our value, you should accept this, that doesn't help. And that leads to throwing the baby with the bathwater. That uh, leads to trashing all these liberal ideas, saying that these are all just Western value impositions. That's why I underline sometimes to uh, the need to de-Westernize liberalism and you know, think it through in a more universal, comparative, multicultural, let's say, relativistic way and understand that societies have different notions of sacred. One more thing. Let's even leave aside liberalism, let's just come to democracy, the basic Western value of the past, let's say, 60 years. I'm not saying 100, because there was a time that the West was ex exporting fascism, and it came to our part of the world from Europe, by the way. But democracy, say, the biggest you know, value that the West is cherishing. Uh, and again, I appreciate that. I believe in liberal democracy, and democracy as a political system is the best of the worst ones that we have. Uh, but I also sometimes see inter something interesting. Western governments and sometimes institutions and media are very critical of anti-democratic rulers, dictators, who are also not pro-Western. But sometimes you have a pro-Western dictator who gets treated a bit more nicely. Current president of Egypt, Abdul Fattah al-Sisi, for example, he's, in my view, a butcher who killed at least a thousand protesters, unarmed protesters, and you know, realized a military coup, and imprisoned journalists, and so on and so forth. Uh, if he was an Islamist, I'm sure he, will get, he would get more criticism from Washington, or, or some newspapers here, editorials, and so on and so forth, or think tanks. That, again, convinces a lot of people in my part of the world to think that, oh, this democracy thing is a lie. The West is just doing this to, uh, just to support their own people and topple the Muslims or good, good people that they don't like. Which is wrong. Which is a conspiratorial understanding of the world which is lacking, again, the, nuance, the vision of the nuances. And, it, it, of course, that point of view lacks... The fact that sometimes the West can have a principle which is good, but it can be not, it itself cannot be loyal to the principle, which is a problem, a universal problem of hypocrisy. Uh, but it works. And let's not forget what happened after the military coup in Egypt. Uh, when the Muslim Brotherhood was overthrown, a government that I didn't uh, have great ideas about, but they were elected, they were overthrown, and Al Qaeda leader Ayman al Zawahiri gave them a message saying that, you see this nonsense called democracy, you see what happens when Muslims are elected, you're overthrown. So in that sense, the double Western double standard here led to the discrediting of democracy in other part of the world. That's why this is a major battle. The Muslim world has to overcome its authoritarian traditions, authoritarian political systems, and the authoritarianism that is embedded in the in very interpretation of our religious tradition. We need that. We need that change. We need that reform, if you will, that. And a lot of people are working on it. Uh, if others want to help, they can help us best in the best way by simply being loyal to the good principles that they preach and we accept, but they sometimes forget. That's all for for me tonight. Thank you for your attention.